The topic that has been given to me is high-risk ACS patient profiles, rationale to use potent DAPT for 12 months and beyond. The platelet, we all know, is the center of pathobiology for the acute coronary syndrome, myocardial infarction, and a cardiovascular event. There are 80,000 receptors on the platelet surface, and it's a highly reactive entity which creates havoc in our milieu. We all know aspirin plays a central role, and in the 1990s, we got to know that adding a P2Y12 receptor antagonist to aspirin definitely improved mortality and recurrent MI, which was proven well in the CURE study and the PCI CURE study. So why do we need antiplatelets beyond one year after our complex interventions? Today, we are trying to cut down the duration of antiplatelets to six months, three months if possible, and so that we have less chances of bleeding and less chances of uh, intracerebral hemorrhage. Contradictory to that, I'm saying, why should we not give antiplatelets beyond one year? The purpose is very clear. We would like to reduce the ischemic events. However, this has been tempered by an excess bleeding. So we need to balance the ischemic risk with the bleeding risk and thereby decide which group of patients would benefit from a dual antiplatelet therapy beyond one year. Despite improvements in survival rates, one in eight patients will die within three years of a STEMI. If you look at the survival in, from 1985 to 1990, 1990 to 2000, and 2000 to 2008 here, though there has been a significant improvement in mortality and morbidity for treating patients with STEMI, nevertheless, a recurrent event does happen up to three years and beyond that too. But this is one in eight patients will die because of a recurrent myocardial infarction. So the risk is beyond one year where we give the antiplatelets and say, this is the mandatory period when we would like to give. So there is a duration where we want to give antiplatelets. It's a mandated DAPT duration. And we have a duration where you have a possible benefit of a DAPT, where we would like to try and, and test whether a DAPT would benefit the patient beyond the one year. Approximately 40% of the recurrent MI patients, it occurs two to five years after the index event. This was in an observation study of 307 consecutive patients experiencing a second myocardial infarction more than one month after the first event. So 40% of the patients have a second MI in two to five years. So there is a high residual risk which is seen in the year following interruption of a dual antiplatelet therapy to a single antiplatelet therapy. So this is a high risk group wherein probably they should get the benefit of using two drugs instead of a single antiplatelet therapy. This was a real landmark trial, it's a registry called the REACH registry, which is what happens after a person has suffered a myocardial infarction and they did a four year follow up. A prior MI with or without a history of ischemic events have a continuous and linear risk of cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction or stroke for greater than three years. In the first year, the cumulative incidence of cardiovascular death, MI or stroke was 4.7%. But in the second year, it became a, an increase of uh, 3 to 4%. In the third year, about 11.7%. In the fourth year, about 15%. About 32,000 patients studied in this REACH registry, and the four-year event rate in patients with the prior MI was quite high. Every year, there's an increase in the incidence of a recurrent cardiovascular event. And why then should we stop our dual antiplatelet agents after the first year? Why not continue the benefit for these patients where the risk is accruing every year? If you look at diabetes, which is a high-risk group, diabetes is associated with an increased risk of death, MI or stroke in patients with prior ischemic events. So if you have diabetes, the risk for having a recurrent event is higher, up to 22%, whereas for, for if you don't have diabetes, it's much less in the range of 13 to 14 percent. Again, this is a high-risk group which would benefit from a dual antiplatelet therapy extended beyond one year. This was a prospect study. About 629 patients were followed up after an acute MI, and they had no culprit lesion, no additional culprit lesion beyond the, the lesion which was produced in myocardial infarction. About one culprit lesion and more than two culprit lesions. If you look at the risk of a recurrent event for three years following an event, the risk is more if you have more than two non-culprit lesions in the coronary anatomy. So it's just not the culprit lesion which is producing the recurrent events. It is the non-culprit lesion 
which was defined in this study as more than 30% stenosis. So if you have a more than 30% stenosis and more than two lesions are found in the coronary anatomy, the recurrence of events is much higher, 24% when compared to a person who has got a, no additional non-culprit lesion. So this is a group which is again a high risk group. So just because you have done the culprit vessel angioplasty and he has a mild lesions in the other vascular bed, he still stands to have a recurrent event up to three years beyond the 12 months of mandated dual antiplatelet therapy. So why not consider giving a dual antiplatelet therapy beyond one year again in this group? The risk of non-culprit related recurrent MI is twice that of the culprit related recurrent MI. So if you have a culprit vessel, the non-culprit vessels are more often the cause for a recurrent MI than the culprit vessel. Four or five studies which have very clearly seen and the data was taken from Medicare, healthcare, from UK, Sweden and France, from the various data registries and national health uh, electronic data what they had and they found that one in five patients were event free for the first year post MI, suffered an MI stroke or death within three years. Across the globe in various countries, the, the, the national registries have shown that between 16 to 20 percent of the patients had suffered a second event within the first, after the first year after post myocardial infarction. One in five patients, even free for one year post MI, they did not have a second event within the first year, but one in five patients after the first year definitely had a recurrent event. About 20 percent of them definitely had a recurrent event there. This was from the Sweden analysis. And of course, diabetes, we all know, the cumulative incidence of cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, stroke in the first year post MI survival population, one in four patients had a recurrent event there. 25 percent incidence with diabetic patients. The influence of a prior myocardial infarction, the cumulative incidence is again quite high. Again, one in four patients with a prior myocardial infarction have a higher incidence. So the evidence is accumulating that the risk is just not up to the first year, but beyond the first year. And if you have a chronic renal disease, the risk is even one in three patients, about 30% chance that you'll have a recurrent MI in the first three years. So the, once the concept of dual antiplatelet therapy had come in, the CURE study proved very clearly that adding a P2Y12 receptor antagonist to aspirin decreased the mortality by about 20%. The hazard ratio was 0 0.80. The credo trial, the PCIQ trial showed that probably it's about 20 to 30% reduction in mortality by adding a P2Y12 receptor antagonist. The Karishma trial was another trial where they studied beyond 12 months, beyond 12 months. A lot of the studies were done up to 12 months, but beyond 12 months, Karishma was trial was a ne negative trial, a neutral trial, which did not show that adding a P2Y12 receptor antagonist clopidogrel to aspirin did make any change. What it showed, the cardiovascular death, MI or stroke, 6.8 with the combination dual antiplatelet therapy and 7.3% aspirin alone with placebo. P-value 0.22. It was a negative trial showing that there was no benefit of adding a second antiplatelet agent. But mind you, when the subgroup analysis was done for the patients who had a prior myocardial infarction, adding a second antiplatelet agent definitely made a difference in the outcomes. This study has already been alluded to, the DAPT study, wherein the clopidogrel was given or prasugrel was given beyond 12 months, up to 30 months, they were treated with a dual antiplatelet therapy with a significant reduction in stent thrombosis, definite and probable, significant reduction in MACE, death, cardiovascular events, death, vascular death, non-cardiovascular death. So MACE was reduced, stent thrombosis was reduced, there was a significant improvement in the outcomes. But what was tempered down this benefit was an increase in the incidence of hemorrhagic complications and major bleeding there. The major bleeding was definitely higher, the gastro moderate bleeding was quite higher, p-value was very significant and the BRC type 235, again the bleeding was quite significant there. Among CAD patients with acute coronary syndrome treated with drug eluting stents today, continuation of the thenoperidine plus aspirin therapy as compared with aspirin therapy alone beyond one year reduced the risk of ischemic events. But the clinical benefit of extended thenoperidine treatment was tempered by an increase in incidence of bleeding events. There was a need for an additional trial which showed that the newer antiplatelet agent ticagrelor would show some benefit with an extended DAPT therapy. So the long-term use of ticagrelor in patients with prior myocardial infarction was studied and the study design was in patients who had more than 50 years of age with a spontaneous myocardial infarction, one to three years prior to the enrollment and at least one additional 
atherothrombotic risk factor like diabetes, CKD, and our previous stroke. About 21,000 patients were studied with a ticagrelor dose of 90 milligrams twice daily with a background of aspirin, ticagrelor 60 milligrams twice daily with a, tic at a background of aspirin, placebo with aspirin, one year or one up to three years after a prior myocardial infarction. The primary efficacy endpoint was a composite of CV death, myocardial infarction or stroke, and the primary safety point was timid defined major bleeding. And what did we find? We found that there was a significant relative risk reduction of about 1.27%, absolute risk reduction of 1.27%, and the p-value was significant, p-value of less than 0 0.004. So when you compared placebo with an additional dose of, with a second dose of uh, I mean, 60 milligrams of ticagrelor, given it beyond one year, up to 30 months, up to 30 months beyond the, the mandated DAPT therapy, there was a significant reduction in the ischemic events, but there was a slightly higher increased incidence of bleeding with this combination there. So the TIMI major bleeding was significant, 115 events with ticagrelor versus placebo 54, a p-value being very, very significant there. So whom do we treat? When should we treat and why should we treat? Patients with a prior myocardial infarction at a higher risk of atherothrombotic events like multivessel disease, even if you have a non-culprit lesion, multiple prior myocardial infarctions, diabetes mellitus, and more than 65 years of age group and a chronic renal dysfunction. This is the group who are at high risk for a second event and probably this is the population which should be targeted for an extended DAPT therapy. One need to reevaluate and dynamically assess which patients would tolerate an extended DAPT therapy. If there has been an event of bleeding during the mandated 12 months of DAPT therapy, probably we should go on to a single antibiotic therapy. So the decision making after mandated DAPT Comprehensive clinical evaluation is very important. The bleeding risk should, uh, if it, the bleeding risk outweighs the ischemic risk, probably one should change over to a single antiplatelet therapy. And if you have a ischemic risk outweighing the bleeding risk in the form of a recurrent ischemic events on on DAPT, stent-related complications like stent thrombosis, acute coronary syndrome, male elvis systolic dysfunction, CKD, prior ischemic stroke, prior myocardial infarction, lesion complexity, or more than two non-culprit lesions incomplete stent opposition or a residual edge dissection, this is the group of patients who would, should benefit from an extended DAPT therapy. The certain new points were coming in the 2017 ESC focused update on DAPT. What it said was the decision for DAPT duration should be dynamic. It should be dynamic. You should reassess the patient at every visit whether he has an increased risk of bleeding. If there is no such indicator, probably that benefit should should get the benefit of using an extended DAPT beyond 12 months. So the decision to continue DAPT beyond 12 months should be a dynamic decision, not just that it is mandated because of the first time. The discontinuation of P2Y12 therapy after six months when stenting in ACS patients, when the precise DAPT score, the bleeding risk score is more than 25. Certain high risk features of stent driven recurrent ischemic events also mandate that this group of patients should get a DAPT beyond 12 months. We are familiar with this precise DAPT score and the Pegasus trial gave us a conclusion that both the European Society of Cardiology and the American College of Cardiology said long-term DAPT beyond one year may be considered in appropriate selected patients with NS elevation MI or ACS patients after careful assessment of ischemic and bleeding risks and that should be done in a dynamic way. The guideline recommendations say that DAPT is mandated for patients with STEMI PCI or ACS PCI for one year and then if you have a patient who is having an increased bleeding risk, probably give them drug for six months and change over to single antiplatelet therapy. But a evidence-based practice based on Pegasus, they said 60 milligrams of ticagrelor twice a day can be given beyond one year in patients who are at a high risk for a recurrent ischemic events. This has to be balanced with the bleeding risks which can happen in certain subgroup of patient population. Thank you for your patient hearing.